Okay, thank you very much. Can you, uh, first of all, most important, can you see my slides? Yes. Excellent. Um, and so thanks very much uh, to everyone, uh, and especially Oliver and Christoph for the invitation to participate today. Um, so, so I'm gonna talk about two different models we've developed over the past couple of years. Uh, the first was called D-Cell, and most recently, last month, we published something called Drug Cell, I'll explain in a, a moment or two, uh, which attempt to entrain the inner workings of a deep neural network to cell biology, and then apply that, that model in different ways. And the key point is that when you have not a black box, but you have a model that, that, uh, whose, whose inner workings respect what we know about cell biology, it's much more interpretable. And I'll show you how that interpretation is important. Now, what is the, the motivation from our perspective? And from our perspective, the motivation for, for building such machine learning models is the classic genotype phenotype equation. Uh, and in this case, applied ultimately to cancer. The first model, D cell, is more general. The second model, drug cell, is specifically applied to genotype phenotype problems in, in cancer. And there, there's many types of, of spins of that, of that genotype phenotype problem. But most basically, it's this thing called mutational heterogeneity, or more generally, heterogeneity across the tumor population. And this is taken from a nice review uh, by Burrell uh, seven years ago now. But the idea here is that uh, as you look, even within a single tissue uh, a type of, of cancer, such as breast cancer or lung cancer or colon cancer, even across those, those cancer types or, or within one of those cancer types, I should say, as you look from patient to patient, it is typically different sets of mutated genes that you find driving those tumors. Now, that's not exactly true. There are famous cancer genes like P53 that are mutated in something like half of tumors. But beyond those few, that handful of, of very well-characterized infamous cancer genes that are often mutated, what you have is a sea of rare mutations which differ from patient to patient, uh, and that is by virtue of the fact they're rare. Here is an example on the right of this, this, this uh, graft for colon cancer. What you're looking at here, it looks like my x-axis is cut off, but this is simply ranking genes by their overall mutation uh, frequency or recurrence in this uh, colon cancer population. You can see here that APC is the winner. It's mutated in something like 70 plus percent of tumors followed by P53, followed by KRAS. But very quickly, you can see here that, that once you're past gene 40 or 50 or so in this ranking, you're essentially looking at genes that are mutated in less than 10% of, of the population of colorectal tumors, and this goes out for quite a long tail. The question is, are these, are these rarely mutated ones important or not? And the answer is people believe they, uh, that many of them at least are, and I'm marking some of the ones here that people uh, sort of have shown through a variety of other methods are likely quite important for colorectal cancer. So the promise of, of, of machine learning is really to provide in, in this context two, two key weapons to deal with how we how how possibly can we diagnose and treat cancer if every patient is so is so different so first of all as we're all familiar machine learning is very good or can be very good at pattern recognition even in in the face of such heterogeneity and the second thing which is going to be, uh, be quite important for the interpretable part of the model is uh, separately in biology, it's been shown that these mutations, although they, they are rare at the gene level, become less rare if one, if one moves up in scale from individual genes to the gene circuits and pathways in which those, those genes function. And there you find that, that in fact, you, you aggregate many rare mutations. And so, so the idea here is, is to combine the sort of power of machine learning and recent developments in deep learning with knowledge of these pathway uh, maps. Just a quick word on, on our infrastructure. I appreciated Oliver's notes about, about uh, this 
this European uh, uh, project and consortium, our, our uh, uh, funding uh, source for, for what I'm talking about is something called the, the Cancer Cell Map Initiative Project. It's funded by the American National Cancer Institute. It involves both data generation shown here at the top, but also, also modeling. And that's gonna be obviously the focus of my, of my talk today. So here, here is the original proof of concept that I will take a few moments to get through, because if you understand this, if I can make this clear, then, then the rest of the talk is essentially a variant of this, of this idea. This is a slide taken from our first paper and, and, and the topic, uh, uh, which described D-cell, a deep neural network guided by hierarchical cell biology, which was trained and, and operated in, in budding yeast as a model eukaryotic cell. So the, the idea here is to is, is in yeast, and as you'll see in a moment, also in cancer. Uh, I'll actually start on the right uh, side of this slide. Uh, we've, we, as a yeast community, have built up a very large number of genotype, phenotype, input, output training examples for this kind of modeling. It's not the original reason why um, uh, the authors here, Costanzo et al., this is a Toronto group, by the way, uh, uh, generated these data, but, but it nonetheless uh, uh, is a fact that, that at the present time, we have about 12 million yeast genotypes, which have been assayed for a variety of phenotypes, um, but mostly, uh, at least uh, the, the, the simplest phenotype that covers this entire set of genotypes is cell proliferation. Simply the rate or, or number of, of cells one gets after a certain amount of time for each of these, these genotypes. Now, how do we get 12 million? These uh, uh, prior projects have essentially uh, endeavored to knock out every single gene in yeast and the yeast genome has about 5,000 genes uh, or so, uh, every pair of genes and then even some triplets uh, of genes. And so if you can imagine 5,000 choose two is about 12.5 million already, and that's how you get this number, if you can think about it that way, without even counting the singles and the triples. So, so it's, it's uh, for, for cell biology, a lot of data, at least, uh, for which you have a, a one, two, or three gene set that's been deleted and the corresponding growth rate. Now, one could apply straight machine learning, and, it ha and people have, eight or nine groups have, in fact, applied straight uh, black box, I'll call it machine learning to this problem, um, and, and developed a variety of models, including neural networks and lots of other frameworks for, for this problem. Here, what we uh, uh, tried to do is, is to use a deep neural network, but one, like I said, that uh, where the neurons are not hidden, in layers, but are actually uh, uh, entrained or, or uh, set to represent different aspects of cell biology. Now, our, our hierarchy of cell biology, first of all, it's a hierarchy. And if you're familiar with a, 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 a resource like the gene ontology, you're already familiar with the idea that the pathway knowledge is, is indeed quite hierarchical. So genes at the top of this model here uh, encode proteins, which come together to form small protein complexes. Of course, most genes don't act alone. They form small protein complexes, which then themselves are the subunits of larger protein complexes, which themselves are part of signaling and metabolic pathways, which happen inside of organelles, inside of cells, and so on. So there were two ways we had at getting at this hierarchy. One is to use the gene ontology as curated from literature over many years by large teams. And this got us about 3,500 cell subsystems organized in 12 layers or so. I'll be talking mostly about the use of Go to, to structure these models today. If you read this paper though, we also had a way of, of, of driving hierarchies like this from clustering of omics data. I'll save that for a different story or for the Q&A. But regardless, it's a large model. And, and what we can now do is we can assign uh, not one, it turns out, but we decided to assign a bank of neurons to each of, of the systems of these 3,500 systems in the model. And so, for instance, if you zoom in, this, there's a system somewhere in this, in this model called DNA repair. It has a bank of neurons, as you can see over here at the bottom right in these little circles. 
the off on states of those of that bank of neurons are meant to capture the state of DNA repair in some in some relatively or I should say moderate dimensional space. And importantly, we are very strict in our structuring, probably too strict, and we can talk about that in future work. But here we require that uh, all non-zero weights coming into this process of DNA repair must come from the, the sub-processes that, that feed into it. And so for instance, DNA repair is a, a larger pathway that, that factors into several parallel pathways, such as double strand break repair. And each of these have, have of course states represented by banks of neurons. And only these states are, are allowed to, to be learned to have non-zero weights during a, a conventional training process of this, of this neural network. So, th so there we have it. I think I've just explained in enough detail at least for you to understand what's happening at a high level. And then we train this model uh, against these 12 million uh, genotype phenotype pairs. This work, by the way, before I forget to acknowledge all the great people, is, is the brainchild of Jinzu Ma, who now is a professor at Purdue University with, with um, my, my longtime collaborator at Tel Aviv University, Rodet Sharan, and Mike Yu was a grad student in the lab who was also absolutely instrumental to, to this work and is now in, in Chicago. Okay, so first of all, does the model perform predictively well? That's not the main topic here, but, but we have to at least look at prediction. And in fact, it does capture the, the growth fitness quite well. Here are the measurements versus the predictions Shown, shown here at, at left over this 12 million or so measurements. Now, if you capture that as a single number, you can look at Spearman or, or Pearson correlation. Uh, and I forget actually which one we're showing here, uh, but, but correlation is, is of course uh, a succinct measure of performance. And, and that number happens to be 0.5. So it's 0.5, it's, it's somewhere between zero and one. So, so okay, but is it good or bad? We think it's, it's, it's actually quite good because in fact, if I simply go into my own lab and try to reproduce some of those genotype phenotype measurements, my ability to do so has a correlation of measurement one versus measurement two of about 0.68. So we think that now certainly it's plausible a model could, could actually exceed the performance of, of reproducibility of experiments, but nonetheless, um, we thought that was quite a high bar already. And so, so uh, uh, there is that. Um, in interest of time, I'm not gonna explain all of the other comparisons here. I do wanna show what happens when you do black box learning on the same or conventional deep neural networks on the same problem. If you allow um, fully connected of each layer to be fully connected to every other with the same number of neurons, of course, you've added many more parameters than the D-cell model is allowed uh, to have. Your performance is about the same. So in that, in that case, uh, D-cell does no better, no worse, it's significant, or it's not significant uh, in, in terms of a difference. The interesting result, though, is if you, if you constrain the number of parameters in the model to be uh, equal to the number of parameters D-cell has, then the performance looks like of, of, of actual biological structure does outperform on average the, the sort of random structure that, that you'd get in, in a matched situation. But, but the, the real uh, intent here is to now interpret the model um, given that we've, we've, we've been very uh, draconian as to its structure. And so here's one example of how it's done. Um, uh, here is a double gene deletion genotype. Uh, two genes were deleted, PMT1 and IRE1. The result of that was uh, very, very slow cell growth. Blue here, uh, whether you're at the genotype layer at the left or the phenotype layer at far right, or looking inside the model in between, blue is meant to show a reduction of activity of that layer, and red would be, uh, it's not shown here, but would be an increase in activity. So here we've, we've zeroed out the gene inputs and observed uh, both in, in the simulation and in, in, in reality, the cell doesn't do very well. Now, to, to understand why that might be, um, there's, there's a variety of approaches that we can talk about for model interpretation. I'm not going to claim any of the ones we're using are, are, are um, I'm very happy with, and we can talk about that in future work. But nonetheless, the sort of general idea is you look at the neurons whose states are most perturbed by your input genotype. And uh, in this case, you simply then look at, at to what uh, processes or systems do those neurons map. In this case, they map quite unambiguously to two processes, 
a sub processes uh, or a sub process of a super process related to endoplasmic uh, reticulum unfolded protein response and its parent response to ER stress. Uh, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, uh, talk too much about it, but one can then go and do experiments to monitor directly the activity of ER uh, stress using a GFP tag on this gene reporter called HAC1. That's what's shown over here at right. And, and you can see that, in fact, the model's simulation has, even though it's never seen anything about the internal states of these systems, it has learned uh, to, to more or less mirror the, the GFP state of, of, of this pathway as measured by HAC1 GFP. Okay, so um, now let me, um, I'm, 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 you know, uh, I've, I've laid the groundwork and, uh, and I've talked about the first model, but now let me talk about the more recent study that this, this first model has, has enabled, and that is called Drug Cell. This, this paper just came out last month uh, in, in Cancer Cell. You can read about it here. It's exactly the same idea, except for now, uh, we're going to pivot to cancer cells, uh, human cancer cells. The training data that, that, that are relevant uh, are uh, in databases, two, two databases. They have now sort of combined uh, and, and call themselves the depth map. But if you look in the literature, there's the Cancer Therapeutics Response Portal and the Genomics of Drug Sensitivity in Cancer Database. The first is from the Broad Institute at MIT. Uh, Harvard and the, and the second is from the Sanger Center. Altogether, you have uh, 1,235 cancer cell lines that have been cultured and sequenced. So you have their full uh, uh, genotypes and we reduce that to a list of genes that look like they've been mutated uh, in those cells. And then each of those has been, has been exposed to approximately 684 drugs. And I say approximately because you, you do have, if you think about a matrix of 1235 by 684, you do have a few holes in that matrix, but not too many. Overall, the amount of training data you, you have, you have about 500,000 cell line drug pairs that you then want to predict how fast or, or how well the cell responded to that. Uh, so, so how well did the cell lines genotype respond to the drug. And so the phenotype that you're measuring here is very similar to the one in yeast. It's a growth proliferation uh, under, under a drug uh, uh, genotype combination. So <clears throat> the, the structure of the model here is shown at, at lower left. There is one addition, which is now we have a drug in the equation. And I, I uh, certainly make no claims as, as to being an expert in pharmacogenomics. And I think all of the people who had problems with smile strings in the last talk could probably tell me a better way to proceed here. But, but what we've done to embed the drug into, the, into this neural network system is we, we take the smiles, we express it as a Morgan fingerprint. And then that Morgan fingerprint uh, is, is the input to a, a shallow neural network, which essentially just gives us a, a low dimensional embedding of, of, of each Morgan fingerprint. The nice thing though, is we do have the ability to look at any chemical structure with this model, not just known labels. The genotype side of this model is very similar to what I've already described. So I won't, I won't go into any more details there. Um, uh, it's, it's, there's, of course, uh, changes and accommodations made to focus this hierarchy of pathways on, on cancer, but it's still quite large. It's got about 2,000 subsystems and about five layers. What happens then is that is, is, so every, every cancer cell uh, genotype is embedded through this hierarchy, this interpretable hierarchy. Every drug is embedded through the root neural network. And then those embeddings are combined by uh, an additional few layers shown here in black. Uh, with the result of, of outputting the response of that genotype to, to that drug. This is work done by a team, uh, Brent uh, Kunze, who is a pharmacogenetics uh, expert who joined my lab from Moffitt Cancer Center about three years ago um, and, and brought us all that knowledge, which has been great. And then Jisoo is his machine learning counterpart in, in the lab, Jisoo Park. Okay, so again, let's look at predictive performance. Um, this is comparing uh, the model's uh, correlation between the predicted growth response of a cancer cell to a drug over those 500 million uh, data points, uh, genotype drug pairs. That's, so, so the correlation is here is performance for, a, for, a, uh, for I, I should say, for a particular uh, drug. I'm sorry, so these are, these are just plotting the drugs as points 
correlating over the cell lines. And now we're comparing to the performance of elastic net, a linear model on B, and a matched black box uh, in, in C here. And you can see that for most drugs, we're, we're performing in drug cell about or exactly the same as other, as other models. But then you have this population of drugs where the, the visible uh, or interpretable model uh, does, does better. And that's, that's true for both, both comparisons. Um, so now let's get straight to interpretation. So uh, here is an example of explaining the response to a drug, uh, uh, paclitaxel, which if you've heard of taxol, paclitaxel is, is simply a it is taxol. It's, it's used for a variety of cancer treatments, including breast cancer. And paclitaxel slash taxol had been uh, thought or was is still thought to inhibit microtubule function. We did see pathways related to or systems related to microtubule function appear in the, in the highest ranked uh, subsystems when simulating the response, having learned it, uh, simulating the response to paclitaxel. But um, even more important than microtubules were glycolytic pathways. And that was somewhat of a surprise. And so here is just kind of a schematic uh, of, of, of what are the pathways that are lighting up in the guts or in the workings of, of that genotype embedding, response to glucose, response to cyclic AMP, insulin, uh, insulin uh, secretion involved in glucose response, and so on. Um, that led Brent to an interesting hypothesis. So maybe now if we come in with, with a perturbation to glucose metabolism, in combination with uh, while the cell is responding to paclitaxel, then maybe we'll see an interesting synergy. And so let me just uh, please ignore everything now except for panel J. And in panel J, what you can indeed see is, is that synergy. If I hit the cell with paclitaxel only or with uh, a glucose mimetic to deoxyglucose only, I get very little reduction in cell viability. But if I do the double whammy, I see a synergistic uh, interaction between between these drugs. Now that is quite anecdotal. And so I think in interest of time, I'll, I'll just refer you to the paper, but this slide uh, uh, was going to go into uh, how, how we tried to make this less anecdotal and design systematic experiments to, to look at this idea, this interesting idea that, 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 that what you wanna do is once you have a, a compound that's well predicted by the model, then you wanna go and look at the subsystems that are, are responding or most important for that drug response simulation and perhaps drug those in, in synergistic drug combinations. And we've tested these, this more generally using a dual CRISPR experiment you can, you can read about in the paper. Um, but what I wanna sort of end with is, is the application of this or the transfer of this model. So having trained it on cell lines now is it good for making drug response predictions in patient populations? And uh, there's, of course, uh, if you're in this field, you know there's not a lot of, uh, certainly comparative in, in comparison to cell lines, there's not a lot of data on, on uh, patient uh, cohorts where you have both the genomic and molecular profiling information plus the drug response outcomes in a properly controlled setting. Nonetheless, those kinds of data are coming online. And this was an interesting data set that uh, was the result of, of this American Cancer Research uh, Genie project uh, recently published earlier this, this year, where the, uh, the, the interest was in, uh, is in evaluating a, a, a new drug called Everolimus. It's an mTOR inhibitor. And it's been thought to, to be effective in uh, ER positive, estrogen receptor positive, metastatic breast cancer cases. And so here is a, a clinical trial where we had a, a mutation a sequence for uh, 700 cancer genes, it wasn't the whole genome, but 700 genes is a lot for these kinds of panels. And then uh, some of the patients uh, got into in, in inhibitors and some, some did not. Now, the, the canonical model was in towards downstream of AKT in a pathway. The PI3K AKT mTOR pathway is, is quite well known in cancer biology. And so it, it, it had been posited, and, and there was some earlier evidence to suggest, in fact, that, that uh, patients that have an AKT mutation should then respond to mTOR inhibitors because that mutation is activating this pathway. And so you wanna simply come in downstream and shut down the pathway. But it turned out in this clinical trial, that's not how it turned out. The difference in survival of AKT mutated tumors or patients versus the wild type was not significant. Okay, that's the survival curve shown over here at left. 
Whereas we found the drug cell prediction shown over here at right was able to meaningfully separate this, this population of patients. Drug cell positive patients are those predicted to respond to, to this mTOR uh, inhibitor and drug cell negative patients are predicted not to respond. And if you look at the reasons why, uh, yes, this, this PI3K signaling pathway does come up as important. That's the middle one here. This number inside is the quantitative scoring scheme we use for, for pathway importance. Um, but other pathways came up. And if, if we then look at, at what's going on, uh, the, the model does use AKT, AKT mutation as a predictor of drug response, of, of a good response, but only if, in this logic, you first don't have a mutation in any of these blue genes. And, and so that's essentially how the model is integrating a number of common and rare mutations over here in blue, even before it looks at the AKT state. So with that, uh, let, me, let me summarize. Um, uh, I, I've, I've talked about efforts in, in my group to, and, and in collaboration with others at Tel Aviv to, to create these, these models that are, that are uh, for essentially the general genotype phenotype translation problem. Those, those models have, have lots of applications um, and certainly in cancer, the one I've pursued here. The idea is, is you get a lot of mileage from, from building these, these models that are open rather than uh, uh, layers of hidden neurons. Um, but that, that said, uh, uh, I think the work is just beginning. And so just four bullet points of, 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 of areas with which we're quite dissatisfied, but of course that's how you do, do science, is, is better ways of capturing the input and output uh, data. We've already talked about the need to, to progress past smile strings. Uh, I'd like to also talk about the need to progress past this gene is mutated or not in a binary fashion, and, and one could load much more information on where the gene is mutated and, and the likelihood of, of that being a loss or gain of function. Uh, I think there's opportunities not to be so strict with the structure as we've been here, but to do joint learning of model structure and function. Um, I've I've already alluded to the fact we're not incredibly happy with our model interpretation algorithms, although I'd be happy to talk about that. But I think what one wants to ultimately do is some sort of path tracing through the model as it's simulated. And then, um, of course, another huge area one could talk about is active learning related topics uh, where the model might, might systematically guide experiments. So with that, I will stop my share and see if I have any time for uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, while everyone is getting ready with their questions, uh, I have I was wondering what is actually what you interpret in your setup because it's it's not like a, a very precise mechanism. It's not like gene A regulates gene B causes phenotype, but it's a bit higher level. So what? What is kind of the, the correspondence here of biological concepts and biological mechanisms? Well, yeah. So, so, so what you get out is a is it are paths that are that, that are traced through this hierarchical knowledge. And so, what you will so so you do get gene as uh, so so you do get the genes as I just said. You can trace the paths all the way all the way back to the most important genes that then feed into the most important. Uh, small pathways, which are subsumed under the under their parent pathways, all the way up to predicting um, the state of the cell, which in this case is is used to predict uh, uh, growth, fitness, or drug response, in, as the case may be. So, so I would argue you do get a very precise pathway readout, as precise as as anything that people show with and networks of genes. There it's one gene affects the expression level of a second gene, expects the expression level of a third gene. Here it's the, the pathway explanations are a gene mutation affects the activity of, of pathway one, which affects the activity of super pathway two, which affects cell growth. Okay, great. Uh, first question by Jean-Philippe Vert, and he asked whether you have uh, embedded or how you could try to embed gene expression data as opposed to the genotypes into or other types of uh, multiomics data. Into yeah, that's, that's we, we have, uh, we, we were going down that road and um, uh, we did not, so, so that's a great idea, it needs to be done. <laughs> um, uh, and, and there's a number of ideas we have, and, I, and I've heard others express too for how you, you might do that. You might put the gene expression level simply next to the mutation state of the gene. Um, 
in fact, I've just reviewed a paper where they've, they've done uh, uh, gene mutation, gene expression, and copy number uh, as, as the inputs to, to the gene. And so the gene essentially moves to layer two in this, in this neural network layering system, not layer one or the input layer as it is for us. The other way that, that we had thought, I haven't seen anyone do it, but that we thought about doing it is, is maybe gene expression should be used as a phenotype. You do your Disney plot, you cluster your data, uh, your cells or your, your genotypes into, into gene expression clusters, and then you label those clusters A, B, C, and now you try to predict what, what cluster you're in um, um, in, a, in, a, um, in this kind of deep neural network framework. So anyway, I'd be happy to talk. Great. Um, Oliver Stickl asks uh, that kind of how about performance? Wouldn't we expect that knowledge-driven uh, networks perform better uh, than kind of just just uh, unconstrained networks? And if anything, it's the impression is that they are performing slightly worse. Well, so I thought I showed data that that uh, uh, essentially there was no difference between the unconstrained model and and, and they perform slightly better. Than, than models that have the same number of parameters. Um, but uh, compared to kind of un, uh, um, models with many more parameters that are not restricted. Sure, well, yeah, so absolutely, if you give the model more parameters, it, it's, it's uh, I, I guess one could argue that it, that it wouldn't cross validate or it wouldn't validate as well. Um, uh, that, that said, you know, giving the model more parameters didn't improve the performance, I guess, and that's Oliver's point. It's about, it's about the same. So, so the way, I, I guess, one way to view this is the, the number of models that one can train that get acceptable performance in these genotype phenotype questions is potentially very large. There is a large potential pool of models one, one, one could have achieved. And if you only care about predictive performance, any one is as good as any other. Now, as biologists, we're interested in the model which has been, which is most consistent with how evolution has solved this genotype phenotype learning problem. Maybe that's, that's the best answer I, I can give. And, and so the, the knowledge constraint helps to select, it's sort of, it, it's a type of regularization that helps uh, uh, the model become not just predictive, but also descriptive. But, but one should keep in mind that there's many other models that would be equally predictive.